Pleasant Sabbath Church. Well, I, I, every week I have, every time I have the opportunity to look down, I'm just flabbergasted by how beautiful you guys look. And today is no different. You know, um, today we celebrate, and it's been said several times today that we celebrate our independence, and we're happy as Trinidadians, Trinbegonians, to, to really celebrate these 62 years. But we know even as we celebrate it, even today as we studied, that Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So we are happy to celebrate independence, but we render unto God what is God. So we are in his house, worshiping him today. Amen? Amen. You know, um, if I had the opportunity to give a prize for the best dress today, you know, in the independence, I see Brian, where Brian, brother, Dr. Bakun, uh, just in his red, white, and black looking regal, and then I, I see brother Brooms as well there, and I'm tempted to say one of them, but then... Brother Ford walked through the door, and I'm like, whoa, that, he win the prize. Brother Ford, Brother Ford. Brother Ford, praise the Lord. That guy knows how to dress, you know? You know what they're talking about. Um, why are you all waiting? I'm not, I smart enough to say nothing about the women. All of you look beautiful. In Jesus' name. And the business too long to fall for that one. <laughs> Uh, church, it's, it's wonderful to be in God's house this morning to worship Him. Yes, um, as I get into this sermon this morning, I have to recognize somebody that's here that when I saw him come through the door, I was just like so excited because this guy, he was my neighbor for more than 15 years. And in that 15 years, we grew to become more than just neighbors. It's almost like brothers, like brothers, brothers, you know, and... Um, we shared many, many great times together when I was very involved in anti-doping in Trinidad and Tobago at the first couple, probably 10, 12 years. I got him involved and we used to be all over the country going by athlete's house 6 o'clock in the morning, um, 12 o'clock in the night, we co collecting samples to be analyzed for anti-doping. And I really love my brother, brother Cliff. Do you understand, Cliff? My brother and uh, friend. I'm really happy that you are here to worship with us today. Amen, amen, amen. So church, you know, um, when, when, I, when I had to identify and pray about what God will ask me to share today, I was already working on a, a seven-part series on worship. Because for some time, this question of, of what God expects of us in worship was, is a big concern, and I was praying about it and studying, and God has given me some, some, some direction, and actually, over some months, I've now completed a seven-part series, and hopefully someday the church will go through that, because it really delves into to worship. What is worship? How is God expects us to worship, and what should we expect when we worship? So this morning, I'm just going to touch on that slightly, but I'm going to connect that with another issue. It, it came up, I remember Sister Jillian mentioned it today in our Sabbath school, and even in our lesson study as our class was discussing, it came up. The, the issue that some of us don't want to talk about, disunity in the church. Disunity in the church. She said what? So I'm just saying it again. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. And so, you know, I was looking at... Um, Past a brother Danny, Danny Shelton, some time ago, and he was, you know, highlighting and talking about this issue about disunity in the church. And I know all the Shagonas members saying that we don't have a problem with that here. We don't have a problem with that. But think about it a little bit. Disunity in the churches are very, uh, it could be very subtle, and it, it, it manifests itself in several ways. And before we get into it, let's bow our heads to prayer. Father and God, as we continue to, to get into your word this morning, dear Father, let your Holy Spirit take control of this entire space in each of us, dear Lord. Speak to our hearts, dear Father, as people that you want to be saved into your kingdom, dear Lord. Overshadow me, dear Lord. Let, 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 let me hide behind the cross, dear Father, so that Jesus Christ will be lifted up and he will draw men to him. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this whole issue of this unity in church shows itself in several ways, and nobody shout amen 
when I mention some of these, but you might reflect and think it's possible. So even now, I'm, I'm understanding and seeing that there are doctrinal disagreements in the church. Some people don't believe Jesus is God. Some people don't believe this and that. And there's issues in the church. So people coming to church Sabbath after Sabbath and don't agree with all the doctrines of the church. There's cultural and ethnic differences. So some people might even say today, well, yes, it's independence and yes, it's Sabbath, but I on the parade because I trinity the bone. You know? There's personal conflicts and offenses. Some members don't talk to each other. Not in sugar on us, right? There's leadership disputes, and I, I have actually seen at the highest levels even in our conferences where people in authority try to mash up and break down each other in the church. Gossip, slander, lack of vision and direction. Somebody say amen for that one. For that one, <laughs> we're struggling. Resistance to change. Even social and e economic differences. Not in, this one I don't feel happens in Shogun, but in some churches. Social and economic differences. And with all or most of those things, to some degree, happens even in Shogunas. So this morning, the message is not for the unconverted heart. The message is for those of us who would call ourselves believers in Jesus Christ. So I would like to submit to you today that this unity is a manifestation of our true relationship with God. When we truly worship, I want to submit to God in a way that he desires the issues that cause disunity and division will disappear. That's my thesis today. If we truly worship God in the way he desires, in the way he has called us to, the other problems will disappear. So God is amazing, you know. If you, if, as we studied in Mark and we were going through the lessons, when, when they asked Jesus these presumably difficult questions, questions to trap him, he didn't get caught up in the issues, you know. He went to the backstory. In one case, he said, what did your father Moses say? So answer the question. And then in the next case, he said, well, if you could tell me this, I will answer your question. Amen? And so Jesus wants us to understand that there is a fundamental issue that we must, must pay attention to if we want to address even this issue of disunity in the church. And I'm going to cover three, three realities that we must all come to in our service to God to help us to move to the unity. And, and let me just say quickly that um, Sister White speaks of this in 1901, way back in 1901, when the church was just a, a fledgling church. She said that Satan well knows that success can only attend order and harmonious action. He well knows that everything connected with heaven is in perfect order, that subjection and thorough discipline mark the movements of the angelic host. It is his studied effort. It is what? Studied effort. Yeah? That, that means he ain't playing around. He take his time, he think about this, and he formulate a plan. It is a studied effort to lead Profess, listen to this now, to lead professed people of God and make them believe that order and discipline are enemies of spirituality. It is his professed. So Satan isn't playing around. And when we see certain things manifest in the church, we have to understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not the brother is the problem, you know. It's not the sister that's the problem, you know. It's Satan is the problem. You understand that? And so, unity in the church, though, is very, very important because for, 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 for a lot of people in the world looking on, for some of us, our neighbors don't come to church because of the disunity in the church. 
Because they don't see Christ in us, they're not, they're not drawn. Because we, the Bible tells us of Jesus Christ be lifted up. So once we lift up Christ, what we have to do again? So if, if we find that those around us are coming to God, that we know we are lifting up Christ in the right way. If we find that we know a whole lot of people, we are friends in the world, our neighbors, our family, and nobody says to us, I want to come to church with your Sabbath. Think about it. Are we lifting up Christ as we should? So the three profound realities, I'll go really quickly. The first one, we are created and called to worship. That's the first thing we need to understand. We are created and called to worship. And I'll take your minds back to Genesis 1 when Adam and Eve were created. And I could only imagine that as, as Adam opened his eyes, he saw this beautiful, amazing being in his face. He was looking up, wasn't he? Looking up to his creator. And, he, and then God, after a while realizing that Adam needed company, decided to create Eve. And I can imagine when Eve opened her eyes, she didn't see Adam first. She saw her maker first. And ever since they were created, then God started to what? To come and to, 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 to be with them. Yes, he walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, the Bible tells us. So they were worshiping God as, as their creator. And we are born and called to worship. You know, throughout time, throughout the history that is recorded, men have been trying to worship. If you look at all the ancient civilizations and, and the archaeologists have found all these artifacts that show that there is some, something that, 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 that worship is happening you know, there's some deity that they're trying to identify. And while we understand by God's grace and while we have been, been called to understand the true light, the recognition is that they understood that they needed to worship. They didn't understand who they needed to worship. Right? But they understood that they were, were, were needed something bigger than themselves. And that's the realization that we have to come to. That we, as creator, creation, have that desire, that deep need to worship. Amen? And I want to I wanna, I wanna couch that in, the, in, 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 in Revelation chapter um, 14, verse 7. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. I really want to take a, a quick look at this whole issue of being called to worship. So I talked to you about the fact that from the very beginning at creation, God created man to worship. And here we're talking about the end of the Bible in Revelation. And we will read the Bible saying, saying with a loud voice to what? Fear God and give glory to him. So when you fear and you give glory, what is that? When you give glory and adoration, what is that? You're giving worship, yeah. So even at the end of time, this is one of the angels' message, yes? Amen? This is one of the messages that God has sent for the end time people. This is the, this is the word where Jesus says, My sheep know my voice and they hear my voice and when they hear my voice, they will follow me. And this is the message because everyone that Jesus calls will hear this word and they will understand that their creator is calling them. Fear God. Give glory to him. And what do we mean by fear God? You know, a lot of people, especially children, may, may, may what, what, want to fear. What, what, is, what, what do we mean by fear? Are we supposed to be afraid of God? In some sense, yes. Imagine, but, but think about it. When we consider who God is, Yes, we would like to talk about God is love and God is mercy and, and he's all of those things. But imagine this is a God who can speak and make things happen. <laughs> you know, if he wanted to wipe you out like that, he just had to think about it first. It happened, done. I would be afraid of something like that. But we know he's love, so we're not afraid, yeah? But we're in awe of who God is. 
We're in awe of who God is because he's just amazing. And that, awe, that awesomeness leads us to bow our knees now in reverence. Amen? So the Bible tells us in Revelation that we are to fear God and give glory to him for what? The hour of judgment is come. It means that something is happening that those people who fear him, who give glory to him, will be victorious in the end. I love, the, I love the, the word of the Lord, you know. So it says, give glory to him follows as a natural response to recognizing God's greatness. Yes? For the hour of his judgment is come. In the case that this call to worship is both urgent and critical. How many of us today, this morning, really think that this is an urgent message for your soul? To give God glory. That this is life and death right here. To give God glory. To worship God. You know that was a big problem in, 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 in heaven. That caused all the melee. Satan wanted to worship. He wasn't happy that God alone was being worshipped. He like, I know you're amazing, you know, but I think I'm cool too. And I feel... I, with all of this, could get something too. Yeah. So he was going after the worship that was supposed to be God's worship. But the Bible calls us to fear who? And give glory to who? Amen. Amen. There's no two ways about it. God is calling us to give glory to him because the hour of his judgment is come. And then to do what? This is, this is the beauty of it. It wraps it up now. And then to worship him that made the heaven and the earth and everything in it. Somebody had to say amen for that. Because God is saying to us, church, that the first thing we need to understand as if we want any part with him is that he created us. And because of that, we need to fear him and give glory to him. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, I was created to worship. Tell them you were created to worship. Amen. So worship, as we recognize in, in, in this text, worship then becomes what? A response, yes? Worship then becomes a response. When we see who God is, when we understand and experience who God, then there's nothing else to do but drop on your knees. And praise God. There's nothing else but to recognize the deep sense of awesomeness that you're faced with in, in, in that moment. And so our response to God is in worship because of his greatness, in awe and reverence. Our worship then is a fulfillment of our purpose because we're created to worship. So when we worship, we honor God. So imagine for one second that you had the opportunity. You know, I'm going to say something. But I see it happening. I'm going to talk about something inanimate. But I see it happening in people for real. Parents with young children, babies. I have noticed, and, and I was, I'm a granddad of two, so I have noticed that when the child is a baby, there's this, this desire, especially by the mothers, for the child to call their name first. Am I right? Am I right? And if they dare say, Dada first, it's problems. They're ungrateful. Who bring them into the world? And, and that's how it goes. That's the, narr that's the narration right there. But imagine then that we are created by God. Who should we call? Who should we honor? Abba, our Father, the one that deserves that glory and that honor. Yes? Worship then must be, is a fulfillment of our purpose. But worship also, don't, don't be mistaken, is also a command. The creator of the universe invites us to his presence as beloved children to participate in the eternal song of heaven where all creation declares the glory of God. That's what it is, I know. It's an invitation to join in what the, what the Father has created. 
Because everything, the Bible tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he, Jesus Christ, is Lord. Amen? And so what God is doing is inviting us to be part of that. You know, sometimes it hurts my head because I imagine what it would be like if I miss out on heaven. If I miss out on spending eternity with Christ. And right now, by his, his grace, it's the only thing that's important to me. Yes, I love my family and I want to do everything right by everybody, but I want to see God. I want to see Jesus. Yeah? And I know as I go through this sermon, I'm talking about this unity and worship and some of my younger friends up there, all my young friends up there, you know, you might be saying, well, this is not for me. This is for the old people there. All this, all this talk is for the old people. But remember, Samuel was called at what age? What, what age was Samuel called? Twelve. He was twelve. He was twelve when God called him. And, and the, the, the prophet had to say, it's not me calling you, it's God calling you. You know? And David was fifteen. That's the age of some of you, these guys here. 12 and 15. And um, Daniel was 17. So, so the word of the Lord is not just for the mature folks. It's for every single living human being. And young people, I want to impress on you that as, as you come to church week after week, it's not just about attending this space, but building a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the first point is that we are created to worship. The second point is that true worship, as we saw in the text, is a result of encountering God. And I, and I really want to spend a little time right here, please, if you, if you allow me. Because I think this is the crux of the matter. All right? Worship is not just, as we all understand, it's not just an outward expression. It's not just about how loud we can say praise the Lord. Although we should, if we're really excited, we should praise the Lord. You know, without holding back our voice. It's, but it's a result of an inward transformation. I submit that true worship can only occur when we have genuine encounters with the living God. And I want to sub substantiate that by using three biblical stories. And I'm not going to go into these stories, but I, I, you know these stories very well. I want to start with that, that story of that, that man was on, that was on the journey. And he was there in his carriage and he was going down. And he had somehow, he had gotten his hands on the scripture and he was reading the scripture. But he wasn't understanding and God sent the prophet to him. Yeah, Philip came up to him. And, and Philip said, I notice you're reading the scripture, you're, how, how you're getting through, you understand it? What he said, how can I, unless somebody explain it to him. And, he, and, then he, and then he got into the crux of the matter. This is a beautiful thing, you know, if we take up the Bible and we start to read it. You know, the Bible, he was like, who, who this text talking about? Is it about this man here? Or is it about something else or somebody else? And then Philip was able to tell him about Jesus Christ. And he used the word to, 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 to share with him who Jesus was. And this is the point I want to get to. Because when he heard of who Jesus was, when through the scripture, Philip was able to show him who Jesus was, what, what was his response immediately? He said, he said hey, 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 stop it, stop it. I'm, I, I, we're passing water. I need to be baptized. I want to be part of this thing with Jesus. This Jesus that you just shared with me, that thing too sweet, I want it. Now, this was a rich guy. He was in charge of the coffers back in Ethiopia. Yes, he was the queen's right hand. But he heard the word and he responded to the word. He saw Jesus Christ. Hi! And lifted up, I will say. And his response was, baptize me. And I want to share with you that, that when, we, when we, we have that encounter with Jesus Christ, it changes us. That deep desire should be in us to be washed clean. And even though most of us here are baptized, we should be want to wash clean every day. Day in, day out, every day, wash clean. Because we know if there's any inkling of sin within our hearts, we have no part with Jesus Christ. And if you want a part with Jesus Christ, we need to be washed clean. It says, what prevents me from being baptized? Paul. We know Paul. Paul was killing Christians, yes? 
he was enthusiastic about it too. Happy that he was killing Christians. Because why? He thought these Christians were spoiling the thing. They were going against the word. And so he had all of this righteous indignation and he was killing Christians. The Bible tells us that he held, he held the coats for them as they stoned Stephen. So he was, he was going about and he was on his way to a place called Damascus to kill more Christians. And he encountered Jesus. On that Damascus road, the Bible tells us that his, 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 his whole entourage stopped because there was an angel in front of them and they could go no further. And he, he had that encounter right there with Jesus and Jesus blinded his eyes. And we know because the power of God is so amazing. This is a guy who was going about life in a certain way and he encountered Jesus and 180 going the other way. With the same fervor. So don't tell me that I used to party and jump up to Marshall and then I come in church and I want to sit down like this, you know. And I can't say praise the Lord, hallelujah. I don't know what happens to us when, when we, we... Yes, Jesus takes away the tendencies for sin, but we should have that exuberance in our worship. We should not be afraid of who's sitting next to us, how they will think. You know, I was, I, I was, when I was in Anguilla, there was one brother. He used to mostly sit down in the back of the church. Now, that church is three times the size of this church. And from the back of the church, once he's happy with what he said, he said, praise the Lord, and you hear him from the back to the front. So you know how loud he is. No shame. Happy to praise the Lord. Are we happy to praise the Lord? So when Paul encounters Jesus... He got a new name. Amen? Amen. Yo, somebody know what I'm talking about here. Yeah. He had a new motive in his life. And, and he says, for me to live is Christ. Amen? Amen? And to die is what? Some of us afraid to dead. I'm talking chinny now. We're afraid to dead. We, we worried if we're going to die. You, in Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry. Because in Jesus Christ, there's life eternal. Anybody know what eternal means? The only thing, the only way you could not appreciate that is if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. But if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you must know that he holds eternity in his hands. Hey, I'm talking about the Jesus Christ who was born as a babe, who gave up heaven. And was born as a babe. Lived a sinless life. The Bible tells us that he was in all points. Tempted. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Tempted as we are. Yet, he did not sin. We serve an amazing God. The woman at the well. Imagine that woman. Just... Regular day, going about her business, getting some water. She meets a man there. She recognizes that that man is not from her culture. Yeah? And she recognizes which culture he belongs to. But then that man speaks to her. <laughs> and she, she confused. Because you're not supposed to talk to me. You know who I am? A little mix with us. We have no part with you. Why are you talking to me? But Jesus said to her, if you only know who you're talking to. If you only know. And then, then Jesus revealed to her who he was or he is. And the woman had an encounter with Jesus. She went back running to her village. She said, come see a man. We have problems witnessing today. By God's spirit, sorry. We have problems. Come see a man. Have we had that encounter with Jesus? Has Jesus really affected our lives in such a way? We want to tell people, Brother Booms, come see a man. Come see a man. I'm saying to us this morning that Jesus Christ does something to people. When we encounter Jesus, we cannot be the same. When we encounter Jesus, we are changed. 
And God is calling us to encounter Jesus. He's calling us to encounter Jesus so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. He told the woman there at the well that, that they, they, there's no worry about coming to Jerusalem to worship and all of that. The day will come that is over. But he that worships me must worship me in spirit and in truth. What does that mean for us today? What does worshiping in spirit and in truth mean? Praise the Lord this morning. I want you to take your Bible, Psalms 51 verse 17. And I'm really speeding now. So Psalms 51 verse 17. What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? The Bible tells us the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. The, spirit, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. God will not despise a broken heart. So when we come to God in worship, we must understand that we must worship him and come to him in prayer. We must prayerfully come to God and share with him what is going on. He said, if my heart is broken, I will not turn you away. If, if even just like that, that, that man who, who wanted the healing for his son, he said, Lord, I, I believe you know, but if you find any belief, unbelief in me, take it away. And all of us need to understand that we will probably want to do things a certain way. But there's something. It's called sin. S-I-N. There's something that is just hindering us in some ways. There's something that is keeping us from getting the victories that we're looking for. And Jesus is saying, even when you come in that way, I will not turn you away. What a mighty God we serve. So we must worship God through our prayers. The, the, the Hebrew uses the word barak means to kneel. When we worship, we kneel before God. It, you, they use the word shacha uh, uh, or saka, which means to bow in reverence. So when we meet God, when we, we, we experience God, we have to fall on our knees. We have to bow down in reverence. We cannot be irreverent in God's presence. So worship in prayer is one way. Another way, Spirit and truth, worshiping in spirit and truth. Psalms 100, 1 to 5. I, can't, I won't go through this whole thing, but it talks about worshiping in praise. Worshiping in praise. So what does worshiping spirit and truth look like? One, worshiping with prayer. Two, worshiping with praise. And, and, and in the Bible, there are more Hebrew words for praise than any other the, 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 the worship words. So, for example, there is the healer, which means to sing praises. And we thank the Lord that we are such fantastic singers in Shogunas Church. The, there's, the, there's the word yada, which means to extend our hands in praise. Yeah? And sometimes, you know, I feel we, people just feel that we imitate others if, if somebody shook their hand up in the air. But hey, if the Spirit moves you to say, praise your Lord, glory, hallelujah. You shouldn't be ashamed to do that. You know, there's, and these are Hebrew words, so there's things people, people used to practice in their worship, in their praising of God. The word halal, to show exuberantly. <laughs> Somebody get that. To show exuberantly. Church, you're too quiet. Where's the exuberance? We tired? Hungry? No, I don't think so. We have to get out of this, this, this docileness. And I'm not talking about being moved by emotions, you know. I'm not talking about emotions. I'm talking about being moved by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit takes off hold of you and shakes you up and shows you who you are and shows you your need for Christ and shows you that in Jesus Christ you can gain the victory, then there's nothing to do but praise the Lord. Yeah. There's another Hebrew word, taka, which says, Worshipping and clapping, you know? When we, when we sing our praise songs, we, we clap a lot. Now, um, there's also, they use the word makal, which is dancing. Don't say that in Adventist church. Don't, don't say that at all. Zama, to make music. 
and, 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 and all these songs that David sang, he didn't hear somebody else sing it before. It was based on his relationship and experience with Jesus Christ that caused him to now extol these words and melodies in praise. How many of us ever make up a song when we think about how good God is? Make up a song. Just sing. Just sing some words that come in from your heart. It doesn't have to wait to, to, to look at YouTube and find a song you like. You can praise the Lord just from your heart. And the Lord will give you the, those words and those melodies. There was one time I think I had a prayer. Not think. I know I had a, 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 a dream. And, and in that dream, the Lord gave me a song. And I was, whole dream, singing this song. But I didn't write it down when I wake up. <laughs> I should have write it down. But maybe that's too far good. I shouldn't be singing. <laughs> but anyway, we worship in prayer. Or what's the second one? In praise. Worship also through acts of repentance. And I want us to look at this one in Psalms 32, 1 to 5. And I'll be quick about this. Worship through acts of repentance. What does worshiping in spirit and in truth look like? What does it mean? Psalms 32, 1 to 5. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is, what? Covered. Blessed is the man who unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Continue. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. This ever happened to anybody? That there's something that they, they, they deep inside they want to say, but like they're afraid to say it or they don't want to say it. And you're like inside your, 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 your joints start to hurt you because <laughs> there's something there that needs to come out. It says, when, for the day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Thou art, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. What is David doing here? Repenting. Yes, repenting. Because David is seeing the depths of his sinfulness. This David that God described as a man after his own heart is saying that I acknowledge my sin unto who? Thee. I acknowledge my sin. I, I acknowledge that I am sinful. And you know that's part of the problem today. Most people don't even understand that they're sinful. Because they, they, their bank account looking really good. You know, their job security. They have what is called job security if there's such a thing anymore. Uh, and they feel comfortable. And you know, that's part, some, part of the challenge that some of us have. We feel, we feel so comfortable in life, we don't recognize that we're in the middle of a war. We are not in the middle of a battle for our souls. But we're comfortable because we don't have to worry about the bills at the end of the month. But we're comfortable. But David is saying here that he, David is repenting and confessing his sins because that is the way that we have to worship God. If we can't do that, then there's no worship. If you can't recognize your sinfulness before God, if you as a created being standing before God, can't recognize the difference there, you have a problem. Some people just feel that they're on the same level with God. That's Satan talking. God is awesome. God is amazing. We serve a big God. He's bigger than all the problems. He's bigger than anything. So we must recognize our need to confess and repent. Anybody ever felt that a day passed and they didn't sin? I don't know. In Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31, we also see another, and I want to read this one as well. Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12 verses 30 to 31. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy... This is the first commandment, 31. And the second is like unto it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And we would have studied that today as well. 
But God is calling us to do something. So I'm saying that worshiping is bowing the knee in prayer. Worshiping, true worship, is praising God from our hearts based on the relationship. Remember, you can't really praise God properly if you don't have a relationship. If you haven't encountered Christ, you can't praise him. Because you don't know what, what you're dealing with. True worship, I'm suggesting, also involves acts of repentance and confession. And finally, true, the way true worship looks like is through acts of love. That's where, that, that's, that's these things. These, these things are how we worship God. When you see somebody, and, 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 and I, I love Sister Far Virgil, because she does see people coming out of, walking out of her community and will always stop. Where are you going, neighbor? Where are you going? And we're happy to give them a lift. Happy to get, you know? That's how people see, and, uh, see love in action. You know? How many people are we really interacting with in, a, in such a way that the fruit of the Spirit is, is manifesting itself? We talked about that today. So, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, true worship results from encountering God. True worship results from encountering God. So we were created to worship. True worship results from encountering God. And, I, and what I want to share with us this morning is then if we get to that point, it gets us to what we started with discussing. True worship leads to unity. Imagine all that I've just talked about happening in your life and happening in the life of the person next to you right now. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> you know, we, when we encounter God and our worship becomes genuine, something extraordinary happens, church. We are drawn closer to God and closer in unity to each other. So if there's a concern for this unity, the first thing we have to look at ourselves and say, am I in unison with God? Am I, have I aligned myself with God? Or is there still things I want to hold on to that are pulling me away from God? Are there still things in my life that, that I, I haven't put God first? Because if you do that, I have a, my wife don't like me to mention her, but she's amazing. There's sometimes I don't think I'm a Christian when I talk to her. Because <laughs> she, 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 she says that she is um, kind but not nice. <laughs> she's kind but not nice. But she has a way of, of seeing situations where sometimes I, I might come to a conclusion that might be a little negative, she was, she's the person that said, well, what if? You know, what if this was not the situation you think it is? You know? And I'm like, okay, all right, I'll take that. <laughs> you know, so she put me in my place quite a few times. But that's what wise is there for, right? Gentlemen, I ain't nobody, boy. <laughs> you all just come out of a men's conference last week. Don't forget that, eh? Don't forget that, gentlemen. <laughs> huh? That's why you're saying it. You're silent. <laughs> so church, true worship breaks down barriers. True worship removes divisions. True worship brings us into oneness that Jesus prayed for in John 17. And in Acts chapter 2, the early church experienced a profound unity which facilitated the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Remember that whole scenario. They spend time together. They pray together. They worship together. So let me just say, unity didn't come before all of those things, you know. Unity came as a result of those things. So if, if, if we're too busy to come together as a church, how will we get the unity? If we're too preoccupied with living our daily lives, how will we get unity? The Bible tells us that all the believers were in one heart and mind. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing in Shagonas? I love all of all you, but I know we're not of one heart yet. I know we're not of one mind yet. 
That don't mean I don't love all you. But I'm saying this morning that if we want, you see, I'm preaching to people who call themselves Christians, people who want to be part. So I'm talking to the person outside who didn't meet Jesus yet, you know. This is a different level. This, this is doctoral studies here. We pass high school thing. Yeah? And so, what we are saying this morning, and, and, and the word says that, that they were in one heart and mind. Their worship was not confined to a temple or a space. Right? This unity was a direct result of their shared encounter with God. I know some of us in our hearts now we say, yes, I want that. Amen. Because the same principle applies to the church. When we truly worship God, we see each other differently. I don't see, people say they don't see color. Right? I don't know that how possible that is. But when you see people, you see somebody who has the ability to be saved in God's kingdom. Amen. When we look around to each other, we see somebody who on that walk with us going down the road. And so, somebody who might have our back. So if I stumble and bounce my toe, they'll, they'll hold me up from falling. I'm talking to somebody this morning, church. True worship cultivates a spirit of humility, forgiveness, and love. Nobody say amen. amen. True unity cultivates a spirit of humility, forgiveness, and love, which are the foundations of unity. So today I urge you to answer the call and aspire to truly worship God. To truly worship God in our prayers, in our praise, in confession and repentance. And what was the last one? Acts of love. To truly worship God. Because if we can get ourselves to that point, we start coming together. We start coming together. So when, 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 when we in the personal ministries department trying to... You see, I was saying to, 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 to Sister Diamond because personal ministry should be the heartbeat of the church. As, as, as we here who, who, who have accepted the call are now engaged and excited to share with somebody else. Because if somebody didn't share with you, you wouldn't be here. But somehow, we have to excite the church to do that. The personal ministries had to come here and beg and say, we're going out on the field tomorrow, or we're going out on the field this evening, and I have a hundred people here, and you know how much I'll have this afternoon? Five. Ten. Ten. I'll go, okay, I'll give you ten. Why? Why do we have to, 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 to fight to get people to do what God is calling us to do? Worship Him. It's not worshiping. It's not just coming to church on Sabbath, brethren. It's not just I'm dressing as nicely as we do in Shogona's church and coming in this beautiful place and singing a few songs. That's not worship. That's not worship. If your heart isn't in it, it's not worship. God ain't even hearing that. I'm sorry to say that. I don't mean to offend anybody. That's not my purpose. But that's what the Spirit says this morning. True worship. So I didn't waste my time because I'm here now worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And so based on that little plea, next time personal ministries make a call, you have to question yourself. If you're, if you're not motivated to be here, if you're not motivated to go on the field, you have to question yourself for real. For real, for real. Did I say for real? Okay. So, what has been your encounter with God? Who is God to you? That's the question I want to ask. Who is God to you? I don't know your experience. I don't know how you met, encountered God, what, what type of experience you had. Maybe you, like, you were like Moses, uh, uh, um, who, who has seen the experience and the, the healing hand of God directly. He said, he called Jehovah Rapha. What does the Jehovah Rapha mean? The Lord who heals. Is God a healer for you? Has God healed you? Because if he has, you should be praising him Amen. in spirit and in truth. 
Maybe you, you probably like Gideon who found himself, you know, surrounded by enemies, doomed to certain death. And God gave him a command. Walk around. Lord, this is the army. This is the Israelite army. We fight. You tell them not to what? Walk around. You tell them not to sing. There's not, there's not, we didn't bring the choir. The choir stayed back. This is the army. So maybe you, you are in a position where you can't understand the directives of God. You're just confused. But when you see God's hand, you will be like him. You know, he, he called Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace and deliverance. Is God a God of peace and deliverance to you? Has he delivered you from some situation in your life? I'm asking this question today because you cannot truly be worshipping if you didn't have an experience. Or maybe you're like Hagar, who found herself in the midst of a devastating situation. Hagar didn't ask for the situation she found herself in, you know. Hagar was a servant, so she was following instructions. She ended up with a child from the head of the tribe who was now, she was now seeing herself as going to be taken care of. All of a sudden, she was put out. Ever find yourself in the wilderness of life? Not sure who's your friend, who's your enemy? And, and so Satan put it in such a way, now it have a word called frenemy. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. You live in a crazy time. But for, for Hagar, as she encountered Jesus, and she encountered God, she called him, he is Elroy, the God who sees. The God who sees. Do you know that God sees each and every one of us? And he cares just as he cared for Hagar, who was a lowly servant. He cares for each and every one of us. What is our encounter? Let us encounter God. If, we, if, if you haven't had a relationship, if you had not had that experience, to, to make you want to serve him in spirit and in truth by prayer, by praise, by repentance, by acts of love. If, if those things aren't guiding you at this moment, then you need to find that. that you need to call out to him. You need to go to his word and find he's there. He's there. He's there. He's all around us. So, true worship, as I said, breaks down barriers. If we want the unity in this church, we have to worship God in the spirit and in truth. And I was in closing. The word says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind, what was this mind? Jesus was praying for unity in the church. Let this mind this desire to have a relationship with God in such a way that, you know, nothing is impossible. And look, the Bible tells us that nothing is impossible with God. Is that the kind of God you serve today? Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Not a thing is impossible. We do not serve a God of wood and stone like others do. We serve the one and true and living God Amen. who created us Amen. and loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. I have one son. I can't imagine saying, go and die for people. Imagine the God we serve. And he's not just loving, you know. He's not just kind, you know. But Jesus laid down his life and he took it back up again. He's powerful. Human beings, what else do we want? Brethren, what else do we need? We only need Jesus Christ. If it is your desire this morning to, to really understand and to begin serving God in spirit and in truth, I invite you to stand to your feet.
If it is your desire today to really, hey, we are in 2024, and 2024, we, we, we're going to start tomorrow, September. Do you believe that? The last eight months just, 2024 start and it's almost done. And believe me, time will be going like this. And it's not getting better, brethren. It's not going to get better. Young people, this world is not getting better. TikTok, YouTube, all of these things. If you spend too much time there, you, and it's not about centering your mind and your heart on Christ, we'll, you'll have a problem. Jesus is calling. How many of us want to say, I serve a risen Savior? He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just, woo, and just, and just the time I need him, he's always there. If you want to, 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 to be part of that kingdom and you want to ask God, for the strength to live a victorious life. I, I invite you to take a few steps just to show God that, you know what, Lord? I really mean business and, and I'm not ashamed to, to put up my hand. I'm not ashamed to step forward. I'm not ashamed because eternity means more than anything. Pride cannot keep me back. Self cannot keep me back. The problems I face from day to day cannot keep me back because, Lord, you are bigger than all of it. You are bigger, Lord. I want to be part of your eternal kingdom. The Bible tells us that eyes have not seen nor ears heard nor have it entered into the hearts of men. What? God has gone to prepare. But we trust and believe. That by his word, by his grace, we will be part of it. The Bible tells us that the Lord is not slack according to his promises. And he promised to everybody that abides in him, that he will abide in them. Amen? Inviting us to, to invite Jesus Christ in this mighty and ma marvelous way into our hearts as we bow our heads. Father and God in heaven, this, this morning, today, the Lord, we just standing all of who you are. We recognize that you are a great God and a matchless God and there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but Jesus Christ. So Lord, we call upon you now. We ask first that you forgive our sins, dear Lord, individually, collectively, that you wash them away, Father, so that there's nothing standing in the way of our relationship with you. Dear Lord, we all know that we have those secret things that we struggle with, dear Lord. We, 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 we ask for forgiveness, but we go back and we go back. Give us victory, dear Father. Help us by your Holy Spirit to find the strength to overcome their Lord because you have promised that victory is ours victory is certain their Lord if we call on your name and so we call on you father their Lord there is hurt among your church there's pain among your people their Lord we ask that you will help and remove these things that your Holy Spirit will bring peace in our hearts their father Dear Father, there are some who are also suffering from disease and illness among us, dear Father. Dear Lord, we know that in your word that you've said that you want us to prosper and be in good health. So because we know that that is your desire, we call on you even now to remove the pains, to remove the illnesses, dear Lord, to let your Holy Spirit course through the veins and remove every disease that might be pestering us even at this moment. Dear Lord, I want to especially pray for the young people of our church. Dear Lord, Satan is battering people, dear Lord, and they might be me caught up in the crossfire not not understanding what's going on their father but speak to their hearts and help them to understand that they're not too young 
to give their lives totally to you, dear Lord. That they're not too young, dear Father, to not get caught up in the things that their friends are doing that may be unlike what you want for them, dear Lord. That they may not be afraid to stand up and say, I'm not doing that because it's not what Jesus wants me to do. Lord, give your church power, dear Father. Help us, dear Father, to do the things that you want us to do today as your Holy Spirit works through us, dear Lord. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. And may we not leave this place, dear Lord, without the assurance, dear Father, that you are working out our salvation. That you, dear God, will be taking care of each and every one of us. You know us by name, by nature, and you, the Bible says you even know the number of hair on our heads. So you have to be an amazing God. And it's to you we pray this morning. And with, it's to you, dear Father, we lift our hearts in thanksgiving. Thanking you, dear God, for who you are and for what you will do in our lives. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.